it's hot up here with all the stage lights. <laughs> sweating to death. <clears throat> well, uh, hello everybody. Uh, as has been alluded to, uh, I will be delivering this morning's message. Um, Pastor Roy asked if uh, I would be willing to speak uh, for you all this morning. Uh, so, some of you may know that uh, I volunteer at the, uh, the youth group that our church has, it's called SWITCH, and uh, I have uh, taught many of Bible studies sort of for the youth group, and that's something that I've been doing for, for many years, but this will be officially my first time speaking to the church. Uh, so, <laughs> if you're going to applaud, you should probably save it for the end to make sure that I did a good job first. Um, that seems a little premature. Um, <laughs> uh, that being said, I mean, I appreciate the fact, I mean, it, it's been a bit of a joke that Pastor Roy likes to bring up the fact that I'm speaking as often as possible. Um, but it has been good because it means that I know that many of your prayers uh, go with me this morning, and uh, I would like to open up this time uh, with a brief word of prayer as well, if you just bow me. Um, Father God, we thank you again for uh, for this time that we've had together, and uh, now as we open up your word to, uh, to talk about the uh, the race that you have given us to run, um, Lord, we just pray that uh, that you would be working in our hearts, opening them to understanding, Lord. Even those of us who have heard these scriptures many times before, I pray that you would reveal something new this morning. Um, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would empower me to convey only the truth of your word and nothing more, nothing less. And we pray that you would just uh, bless this time that we have together. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, somebody shout out the theme of our weekend once more. Maybe the grace! Maybe the grace of humanity. Maybe the grace of humanity. Yeah, something along those lines, right? It's gotten a bit fuzzy over the, over the day that we've been here. Uh, so I believe, I believe that, uh, so Aria and Jocelyn, I know, have prepared a bunch of challenges that many of us will be taking part in as, uh, as teams later this afternoon. I'm sure that we're all uh, looking forward to that. And I believe the inspiration for that was the, the game show on TV, The Amazing Race. How many of you have heard of that show before? Uh, so that's a show where they get, uh, it's like a reality show, it's a competition where they get uh, 11 teams of two to race around the world and along the way they have to complete sort of various challenges and it's kind of this whole big thing. The winner gets like a million dollars or something like that. Um, there's, a Canadian, there's a Canadian version, yeah, we don't have a million dollars. Your prize is a little smaller. Yeah, our, our, our prize is a little smaller than a million dollars, so don't get your hopes up. Just a little smaller, though. Just a little. Like 900,000 dollars. Um, so you really want to compete. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so that's kind of the, the inspiration for, uh, for this weekend's theme. And uh, uh, we've kind of divided that into, uh, into a couple of different branches of things that, we, that we've been exploring together. So this morning, in uh, the devotional that was run by uh, Shinoa and Selena, uh, we talked about sort of uh, the amazing human race in the sense that we are uh, to love one another as we love ourselves, to love our neighbors and even our enemies. And, uh, and so we had some good discussion about that. During our sort of main sessions, we're going to be talking about something a little different, which is the race that has been set before each one of us. Um, because the Bible describes the Christian life as running a race. Um, Paul was particularly fond of the metaphor. Uh, he uh, uses it in several of his epistles. Uh, offhand, I have 1 Corinthians, Philippians, 2 Timothy, Galatians, all of them he uses this metaphor of the Christian life as running a race. The athletic imagery would have been well understood in the culture of the time, in the early church. Uh, in addition to the ancient Olympic Games, which had already been going on for hundreds of years at that point, uh, there was also something called the Isthmian Games, uh, which was held at the Isthmus of Corinth. So when Paul was writing to the Corinthians in particular, they were intimately familiar with, uh, with athletics of this sense. They were held every two years, uh, the year before and the year after the Olympics, and uh, had a very wide variety of competition. In addition to sort of the things that we're used to seeing at the Olympic Games, they would also have competitions for things like singing, and everything that you can imagine, music, all kinds of things, art. Um, but of course, one of the competitions that was in the Isthmian Games was foot races, and they had various sort of lengths of them that uh, athletes would compete in. So the original readers of the New Testament letters uh, would have been intimately familiar with what it meant to be an athlete 
the training that they went through and the heat of the competition and how seriously they took it. And by the grace of God, uh, even as this message is carried down to us today, it's still a metaphor that we're very familiar with. Many of us in school ran races. Maybe it was something that we did for fun. Maybe it's something we did competitively. Um, but many of us also enjoy watching the Olympics, and we kind of understand the rigor and the uh, dedication that it takes to be that kind of athlete. And so we're going to uh, talk in our three sessions together about how the Bible teaches us to start the race, how the Bible teaches us to endure the race, and how the Bible teaches us to finish well. Um, so let's begin this morning. What I'm going to walk you guys through is how to start the race. So if you have your Bibles with you, which I hope you do, or your Bible on your phone, um, please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to be sort of honing in on verses 1 to 3 of Hebrews chapter 12 this morning. I'll read it out for you now. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. So this passage begins with the word therefore, which indicates to us that some context is needed. Something is being concluded in the words that we've just read. Starting in the second half of chapter 10, the author has been talking about the topic of faith. Particularly the topic of the faith that we can have because we know of Jesus. Because we know of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And that it is sufficient to reconcile us to God. The faith, uh, he also uh, talks about how it's superior to the old covenant, which was given to Moses. Um, the covenant of sacrifice, which the Israelites would have been intimately familiar with up until this point. Chapter 11 runs us through a hall of fame of sort of faith athletes, if you will, from before the time of Christ, those who ran the race before us and finished well. And it really hones in on the fact that these are people who looked forward, they ran the race looking forward to a hope that they couldn't even see yet. They didn't, they didn't have the benefit that we have of being able to look at Christ in the past, and see his finished atoning work, um, whereas we have the advantage of knowing God's promise fulfilled through Christ. So it's clear here that the race that the author is talking about that is set before us to run is a faith race. And running a race, especially a long one, is no easy feat. No pun intended. That's why God has provided us some starting advice in these few verses. So, we're going to pull out four things provided for us here, that if we make sure we do at the start of our race, we will be well equipped to get all the way to the end of it. So, kind of honing back in on verse 1, it starts off like this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. The meaning here is twofold. On the one hand, the author is referencing the people who have just been mentioned in the previous chapter, right? He just did sort of that hall of fame of faith athletes, those who came before us, who ran the race, who finished well, who lived their lives by faith. And, uh, and that's, that explains sort of the therefore transition, right? He's coming out of that chapter and he's saying, therefore, let's do this. Uh, and then sort of following the words that we just read, he says, uh, let us also which is implying that we are following in the example of somebody else, the people that he's just mentioned. Now, it isn't necessarily being suggested here that these faith hall of famers are literally watching us and cheering us on as a cloud of witnesses, but that the, by the example that they set, we can rest assured that we're in good company running this race. There are people that we can look to who are examples. We have a, a cloud of witnesses, so to speak, around us who are examples of what it means to please God by faith. And so we know that when we endure hardships, when, we, uh, when we're running this race, that we are in good company. And that is a great encouragement to us. We run in the footsteps of the heroes of the faith which came before us who pleased God by their faith. Hebrews 11.2 says that by running this race, uh, it, it uses the phrase, the people of old received their commendation. They got their commendation from God because of running this faith race. And we can achieve the same by doing the same. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, 
Additionally, if we want to be successful in this race, we need to be constantly surrounded by witnesses as we go along. So this is not just sort of a referring to the old, the old guard, so to speak, but also the people who are in our lives today. In this race, we're going to get discouraged. We need to be surrounded by people who will spur us on, who will encourage us. Uh, Hebrews 10, 24-25, which we actually read last Sunday, for those of you who are there, says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We need those people around us who are going to spur us on as we run the race, who are going to encourage us, who are going to love on us. Furthermore, we're going to need people who are praying for us. James 5.16 says, Therefore confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. In order for us to experience healing, we need people praying for us. As we go through struggles, as we go through trials, and as we struggle with the sin in our own hearts, it is necessary that we surround ourselves with people who are praying for us. And sort of along those lines, we need people who are going to hold us accountable. Galatians 6, 1-2 says this, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. See, we were, surround we were designed to run this race surrounded by other people, not in isolation. A lot of Christians attempt to run the race alone. They believe that they are sufficient to keep their faith strong and to continue pushing forward. And they neglect to meet together, as it says in Hebrews. They neglect to get plugged into a Christian community. They neglect to come to their local church for support and for help. And when they get discouraged, they have nobody to turn to. They're missing the power of prayer behind them. And when they fall into sin, they have nobody to correct them, nobody to hold them accountable. Their faith begins to wither, and they quit the race quickly. When I went to university uh, many years ago now, a shocking number of years ago, now, um, the, uh, the biggest mistake that I made was uh, I knew that I had Queensway back home. But at that time, I wasn't coming back every week like I am now. I was spending most of my weekends sort of out in Waterloo. And, uh, and I, I neglected these verses. Um, despite the fact that I was spending most of my time out there, I didn't bother to get connected to a church right away. I kind of figured, ah, oh, like I go to the church when I when I come home, and that's that's good enough for me. I have friends there, I have support there. And what happened is that when trials did appear in my life, when things did go wrong, you know, even though it was only sort of an hour away, like that's a long distance when you need people praying for you constantly, when you need people encouraging you constantly, when you need people uh, spurring you on constantly. And it became super easy to just get discouraged and to sit in my room and just be depressed because. I had nobody close to me, nobody around me that I could turn to. We need to, if we're going to finish this race strong, if we're going to be able to, to make it the full distance, we need to make sure that we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses who are constantly encouraging us, building us up, and pushing us on, and keeping us accountable so that we don't fall into sin. Continuing on in the passage, it says, Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, so here we're told to let go of two distinct things. And sometimes we kind of just group them together and talk about them as one, but I want to separate them out into two here. The first thing, so the two things that we're told to let go of are weight and sin. We're going to talk about sin first. The Bible likens being stuck in sin to being held captive. Those of us who have grown up in the churches are very familiar with this imagery. Um, Jesus says in John 8, 34, uh, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. They're held captive by sin. God encourages us to correct those in sin so that, as 2 Timothy 2, 26 says, they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Again, this imagery of being held, being held captive. Um, Peter, when writing of the false prophets in 2 Peter 2.19, says, They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. When we are overcome by our sin, we are slaves of it. It holds us in captivity. And it's awfully hard to run a race when we are ensnared by something. We won't get very far if our hands and feet are chained. 
it's very difficult to run like that. And each of us, though we have been made clean by the blood of Christ, we still struggle with our sinful nature daily. We still have sins in our lives that we struggle with, and perhaps even sins that, if we're honest with ourselves, we're reluctant to let go of. Things that gratify us, things that make us feel good, or that make life easier for us. The Bible makes, us, makes it clear to us that these things hold us back. They slow us down. They prevent us from running the race that is set before us. That's why Colossians 3.5 tells us to put to death what is earthly within us. In Romans 8.13 it says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. In order to run this race that has been set before us, we need to let go of the entanglement of sin. And sometimes we're tempted, especially with those little sins that make our lives easier and more convenient, we're tempted to think, oh, the sin that I hold on to is it's just a small one. It's not, it's not holding me back that much. Surely it's not going to affect my running. But Paul writes to the Galatians in Galatians 5, 7-9. He says, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. This is another metaphor that's actually in sort of multiple places in the Bible where sin is compared to leaven or yeast. And what Paul is saying here is that even just a little bit, if it falls into the bread before you bake it, is going to make the entire thing rise. It's either leavened or unleavened. It's not partially leavened. And so, in the same way, these little sins that we're tempted to sort of say aren't that big a deal, they don't affect us that much, they will find their way into our hearts and they will corrupt everything that we do if we do not deal with them. And so if we are to run the race that is set before us, we need to let go of those entanglements. Secondly, let's talk about the other thing it tells us to let go of, which is weight. I believe that it's super intentional that two separate things are described here. There are things in our lives that aren't inherently sinful, but still hold us back from running the race. Our lives are full of idle distractions and, uh, sorry, full of distractions and idle activities that, while they may not be necessarily wrong to do, they are not helping us advance the kingdom of God in any way. Don't get me wrong, there is practical purpose for rest and for fun and for relationship building and for personal development. It's not that you need to spend every waking minute of your life necessarily with your nose in the Bible, but we are encouraged to examine our lives and to ask ourselves, what are the things that I sort of fill my life with, and all they're doing is just holding me back from accomplishing God's purpose? What are the things that I, I hold on to, that I love doing, but they're just not benefiting me in we need to take the attitude of Paul, who said in Philippians 3.8, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. So in the same way that an athlete does not run a race in jeans and a heavy coat, even though it may be perfectly within the rules to do so, we must shed the things in our lives that weigh us down from re reaching our full potential in Christ. As 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, we have to take every thought captive to Christ. We need to examine ourselves and ask, what are the things in my life that are helping to advance the kingdom of God? And what are the things in my life that are just wasting time? So we need to set aside both the sin and also the weight. Continuing on, he says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, Edgar will be speaking tonight, actually, on, uh, on what it takes to endure the race before us. So I will only touch on this point briefly uh, this morning. Many of you have heard the common phrase, uh, the Christian life is not a sprint, it's a marathon. It's one of those sort of platitudes that uh, has kind of spread throughout the generations. Being prepared for one, though, being prepared for a sprint, is very different from training for a marathon. And if any of you have ever run a marathon, you know that that is the case. It's interesting that Frederick Nietzsche, of all people, who of course was not a Christian, uh, was quoted saying the following. He said, The essential thing in heaven and earth is that there should be a long obedience in the same direction, that thereby results, and has always resulted in the long run, something which has made life worth living. 
The marathon that we have set before us to run is pretty well summed up in those words that Nietzsche spoke. It is a long obedience in the same direction. We must train for it. We must be equipped for it for the long haul. We must understand what it takes to endure. When the pain of running comes, when we begin to get tired, when we begin to get weary, we will be tempted to give up. In James chapter 1 it says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And then continuing from verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. We need to develop steadfastness. That's not something that comes to us naturally. We're not naturally inclined to endure suffering. Our first instinct is to quit or to run away from it or to get out of it as fast as possible. And so we need to train ourselves as we begin this race to be able to endure the suffering that we will encounter, the, the, the weariness and the trouble. And then verse 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. From the moment we start this race, we are told to keep our eyes on Jesus. And I want to focus on this point for sort of the remainder of uh, my time with you this morning. And I think that there's three reasons that, uh, that we are given this explicit instruction to look toward Jesus as we begin this race. The first reason is quite simple. As in all things in life, Jesus is our perfect example. He is the template that we are to follow as we run the race. Jesus, we know, lived a perfect human life. He followed the will of his Father perfectly. He endured every hardship and every temptation that we endure. The book of Hebrews, which we are learning from this morning, up to this point, actually em heavily emphasizes this point. There's a huge focus on the humanity of Jesus in this book. For example, in Hebrews 2, 17 to 18, it says, Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Jumping ahead to Hebrews 4, 14 to 15, it says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. We keep our eyes on Jesus because he showed us what it was like to run this race. He ran it. He endured all of the hardships that we will endure as we run it. And we are to look to him for our perfect example of how to deal with all of those things as they come toward us. The Bible makes it crystal clear that following in Jesus' footsteps is something that we are meant to do. In 1 Peter 2, 20-23 it says, For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure but if when you do good and suffer for it you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. So Peter goes as far as to say that that is what we have been called to do, is to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. So when the author of Hebrews is talking about running this race and keeping our eyes on him, that is our template, that is our example. We can look to Jesus whenever we are struggling, whenever we are weary, whenever we are tempted, and know that he endured those same things before us, and that we can follow him. 1 John 2.6 says it very explicitly, Whoever says he abides in him, ought to walk in the same way in which he walks. Our goal in life is to live like Jesus. And as we start this marathon, we need to look to him for our example. Secondly, he is the path, he is the track that we are running on. 
If we're going to run a race, we need a track to run on, right? We're not just wandering aimlessly. Uh, that's not much of a race, that's just sort of going for a run. Um, there's a track that we must stick to. We tend to talk about John 14, 6, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. We tend to focus almost exclusively on that no one can come to the Father except through me part, which is 100% true. But there's deeper meaning to the fact that Jesus is our way. It's not just that he is our way to the Father. He is our path. He is our guide. Running the race for him means immersing ourselves in him so that we stay on track. Um, those of you who have endured my teaching in the past are going to roll your eyes because I bring up this passage a lot. Uh, it's my favorite passage in the Bible. It comes from Proverbs chapter 3, uh, verses 5 to 6. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. We often mess up the meaning of those words, to be honest. I've heard lots of people talk about this passage before, and many times I hear the same words used which is that God will show you which way to go. Um, we tend to picture this verse as coming to a fork in the road where we can either turn left or right, and God will tell us which one of those we're supposed to take. But that's not the imagery that the verse uses. It very intentionally says that he will make our paths straight. The thing about a straight path is that you don't have to think about which direction you're going, you just have to keep walking, right? In the same way that they don't build racetracks with sort of branching paths off of them and you're not sure which way to go, when you're running a race you know exactly where you're going. You follow the path, you just keep your eyes forward and you go. It's actually kind of crazy how much scripture supports this imagery. Um, Proverbs 4, 25-27 says, Let your eyes look directly forward, and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. Joshua 23, 6 says, Therefore be very strong to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right hand nor to the left. 2 Kings 22.2 says, And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and walked in all the way of David his father. And he did not turn aside to the right or to the left. If you read through the Old Testament, this warning of not turning aside to the right or to the left is just over and over and over again. And it's very clear that what God is saying is, listen, if you are abiding in my will, if you are keeping your eyes on Jesus, I will make your path straight before you will not have to worry about the decisions ahead. You will not have to worry about which way you should go because I will make it clear to you. And you will just keep moving forward. And there's a lot of wisdom to be gained from understanding that, that when we abide in Christ, that when we have our eyes fixed on Jesus, as this passage is telling us to do, you need never stop moving. You need never stop working for the kingdom, for he will make a path straight before. And lastly, friends, in this marathon of life, the reason that we need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus is because he is our motivation and our prize. The more that we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the more we take in his majesty, his beauty, his glory, and we will begin to desire everything else in this world less and desire him more. The longer that we dwell at his feet, the more we will realize that it is the best place in the entire universe to be and that nowhere else is better. As the psalmist wrote in Psalm 73, 25, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. When we're running this race, we look towards Jesus because he is our reward. He is the thing that we are running to. He is our reward and our inheritance. Psalm 16, 5 to 6 says, The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. In Christ is love, joy, peace, freedom, glory forevermore. The more that we fix our eyes on him, the more that we will fall in love with him. And our desire to stray to the left or the right of the track that we are running on will diminish, will fade away. The more that we spend time looking to Jesus, the more we will want him, and the more that he will be the only prize that we desire. 
So I said at the beginning of all this that this was advice given to us by the author of Hebrews for starting the race. Many of us in this room have been following Christ for many years. Many of us have started the race a long, long time ago. But the reality is, these principles are equipment that we should have at the start of our race, but that we continue to need for every step of the way. We need to be continually checking our lives to make sure that as we continue running this race, we are still equipped with these things that we hopefully started with. And if we never started with them, then we should seek to get them right away. Maybe you came here this weekend and you've distanced yourself from people. Maybe you don't have a small group who is very involved in your life. Maybe you don't have anybody who you would say is truly keeping you accountable, who kind of has that transparent relationship with you to be able to keep you in check. Maybe you haven't asked anyone to pray for you in a long time. Friend, you are surrounded right now by men and women who would love to be your cheerleaders and spur you on to all that God has in store for you. Plug yourself in somewhere. Surround yourself with people who will be your cloud of witnesses as you run the race. Or maybe this morning you are struggling with sin in your life that is holding you captive. Maybe you've filled your life with so many distractions that you've not really accomplished much for the kingdom recently. Maybe you're kind of looking back on the last couple of years of your life and realizing that it's all kind of been for nothing. That you've been so busy being busy that you haven't done anything for God. If that's the case, I would encourage you to bring those things to the Lord in prayer this morning. To surrender them at the foot of the cross. Because they are only holding you back from reaching the full potential that God has created in you. He wants to use you for His kingdom. He has designed you to be used in His kingdom here on earth. And to accomplish that, you need to surrender the things in your life that are holding you back. Or maybe the race is really difficult for you right now. And you're finding it difficult to persevere. Maybe you're going through some trials that have just left you exhausted and spent, and you just feel like giving up. I want to encourage you to hang in there. Surround yourself again with people who will help you to carry those burdens, because you cannot do it alone. Go to Christ, who is the everlasting source of strength and encouragement who can take your weariness and who understands your weariness because he endured it himself. Fill yourself on the word of God daily because it will strengthen you and will give you wisdom as you run. Or maybe somewhere along the way your eyes have drifted from Jesus. Perhaps you don't feel the love that you once had for him and you just don't have the same drive to pursue him that you did when you started. Maybe you've found another prize in your life, something else to be motivated by, something else that you are running towards. I would encourage you to spend time reading the Gospels and to refocus on Him, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. Because you will learn as you dwell at His feet that nothing in the universe compares, and that nothing else, no other motivation, no other prize has the power to carry you from here to the finish line. Fix your eyes firmly on Jesus, and he will bring you to the end. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much for your magnificent word. We thank you so much that in it you have equipped us with everything that we need to be godly men and women, everything that we need to endure every trial that we will face. Lord, we thank you that in this passage that we have studied this morning, you have given us practical pointers of how we can prepare ourselves for the race ahead of us. Lord, for those of us who are struggling to run that race today or have been struggling for some time, I pray that these pointers might have helped us identify areas that we could improve on. I pray, Lord, that you would help each and every one of us to seek out those things that we are lacking and to fix our eyes on you, to fix our eyes on Jesus that he would be our one motivation, our beautiful prize. We pray, Lord, that as we spend this time together this weekend, reflecting on these things, that even now you would help us to recenter on Christ, that even this weekend we would go home refreshed and prepared to run the next lap. We thank you, Lord, and we pray all of these things in Jesus' name.